Hey there, everybody. I'm Peyton Smith, your social media producer here over at Paizo. And we're here to count down once more again over here at uh, for Pathfinder 2nd Edition. And here today, I have Mr. Logan Bonner here. Sir, it's so nice to meet you. Hello. And uh, we'd like to tell people about yourself a little bit. Why are you here today? What are we here to talk about? Uh, so I'm here because I'm one of the designers of Pathfinder 2nd Edition. You can see I'm right there. My name's ahead of Jason's. That's, that's pretty good, right? Uh, it's a and, hierarchy now in the book. Yes, that's right. It's uh, Oddly enough, it's uh, alphabetical by coincidence that that's how the hierarchy works. Uh, but I'm here to talk about uh, kind of how you play the game. Uh, Mark was on uh -huh. here last time talking about how you make your character. So I'm going to go into kind of what you do as you're playing a Pathfinder game and some of like the, the options that you have as you're, uh, you're going through the world, fighting monsters, looking for treasure, making friends, uh, making enemies. Good. And... Uh, Several other things that we also wanted to do today that we did last time is try to give away some Fumbus coins. Uh, I've got some of the Fumbus coins here on my nice little Ren Fair days, which I have all of these lovely little golden coins that you guys can go ahead and have. Along that's with that, one. like it's this those, is the one I touched. This is the good one. Yeah, that's the good one. You can you can sign that I think and give it away. We also have some of these lanyards that we're going to be giving off as well. And also, one thing that I uh, was told that we can go ahead and give away extra, so we have some extra stuff as well, is this nice, nifty Pathfinder 2nd Edition poster, which hopefully that works out just fine there. So, for Pathfinder 2nd Edition posters, we'll also be giving some of those away as well, just to give you guys a little bit more incentive. So, further on from that, basically on how those work, by the way, is that we will be doing a giveaway thing on chats and we're also trying to be answering some of your questions live as we kind of go through all the content that we have today if you have uh basically make sure whispers are enabled on twitch so that you are able to we are able to message you and stuff like that so we can actually contact you get your email and then get you your stuff and so you know the people who won previously uh tracking codes are being generated now which i'll get to you soon um so further from that let's go ahead and start off with what we got today so playing the game for majority of things is one obviously one of the most important things. So normally there's different modes to play from last time yeah. you told me. It's like of course combat's in there. Mm -hmm. Like how do we how do we shoot? How does magic work? How does all of this other stuff work? But there's also like downtime and various other parts of playing. Right. Would you like to run that down with me to sure. explain how do you play Pathfinder 2nd Edition? Yeah, so um, everything that you're doing in 2nd in Edition is the same kind of gameplay you had in 1st Edition. We just kind of took a lot of it and uh, made it a little clearer for you know new players and people running the game, kind of how it all works together. Yeah. Uh, so we kind of talk about them as modes of play. And uh, encounter modes are your fights. Downtime modes are, I'm not adventuring right now, I'm doing something back in town. Yeah. And then the, the one that kind of holds everything together is exploration. So exploration is when you're traveling from place to place, when you're going through the dungeon. And uh, we talk a, a fair amount in the books about how, like, what the time scale of those are, how precise you need to be, and all that kind of yeah. stuff. So encounters are the most precise one. You're doing six-second rounds. Exploration is a little more loose. It might cover, you know, minutes and hours. Uh, and then downtime is, like, you're taking days off. You know, you're you're having your weekends, you're having your your vacation, um, you're doing things that aren't aren't stabbing, all that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, Princess had a thousand viewers. You, you're you're going to raffle your glasses? Is that true? Uh, well, I'm getting new glasses, but if I raffle my glasses off before I get those, I'll be yeah, in pretty bad trouble. Each lens. Yeah. Okay. So, one of the things I want to talk about, pretty much a little bit more on downtime, and you can also flip through your book if you want to sure. show, yeah. look up some examples and stuff like that. So. What is what would you define as pretty much like downtime? Is it just you're sitting at a campfire? Are you preparing spells? Are you crafting things? Uh, downtime. So that's all stuff you do during exploration while okay. you're out adventuring because there's danger there. Okay. Um, the distinction with downtime is that is this is the time when there's no danger. This yeah. is we are doing our long term goals. So if uh, uh, Harsk the ranger he loves tea. He wants to open up a tea shop. That's something he would do during downtime because he's not he's not looking out for the next ambush when he's doing his contracts and hiring employees for his tea shop. Yeah. Uh, or uh, crafting items is something you might do during downtime. Uh, and this is kind of one that, uh, in some games, you'll never even go into downtime. Like, yeah. this is just a dungeon crawl. We're just fighting things. But if you're doing, like, a long-term campaign, especially, um, or if you're playing in Pathfinder Society, you're going to have some time between adventures that you're going to be spending yeah. on downtime. And it kind of lets you set up for the next thing. And then, you know, you, you get back together with the other players and you kind of say... Oh, here's uh, here's what I was doing 
while we were not out adventuring. And you can kind of share that yeah. and talk about, you know, what you've all been up to. This is this is one of our uh, images for downtime. We've got the uh, yeah. So hold hang, a bit, hang hold it closer to yourself if you yeah. want it in focus. Okay. So I don't know if people are going to be able to. Even though we got new cameras and stuff like that, I don't know yeah, if they'll be able we'll to see. transcribe the entire page. Well, they might if they can get the text. They're going to be transcribing it. Oh yeah. They'll they'll, they'll take a screenshot and, and get what they can out of there. So uh, we but believe this in is you. this is from the GM advice section. There's a, a lot of GM advice, yeah. especially about downtime and exploration, because those are the parts of the game where the GM is really. Uh, playing the biggest role. Encounters yeah. have a lot more precise rules, but these section, these parts of the game, you don't want that precise rules. You want to be able to kind of flow into things and add yeah. things and have the GM kind of, uh, you know, running herd over how that plays yeah. out. So, next up that we'll pretty much have is like, say for example, how does, so for downtime and stuff, how does crafting would kind of go into that? Like, okay. Normally what I've experienced in the past is yeah. like, hey, you're gone for the weekend, but your character was working on this. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of a similar system or is it something different here? Yeah, it's, it's kind of, so uh, the way crafting works is if you have the crafting skill, you can make items during your downtime and uh, you can kind of decide how much of a discount you want basically because it's going to cost you less to craft the item than it would take to, to buy it. Um, and the GM's going to have some control over, like, you know, how easy it is to craft just whatever you want. Um, but hold off on you here. Uh, huh? I could just ask, can party members do downtime together and aid each other? Uh, sure, they can, yeah. And a, a lot of that is kind of, um, like, if it makes sense in the world, yeah, you can do it in the game. Um, uh, and there, there's some kind of, uh, some talk about cooperation, which is on this page right here. Um, so usually... Uh, uh, everybody else can aid that person if you're all working toward the same thing. So, like, if uh, Ezrin's trying to make a, a magic weapon for uh, Harsk, Harsk might be like, okay, I'll, I'll try to help you out with that since, you know, yeah. you're, you're making this for me uh, and go and assist um, to make it go faster or cheaper. Um, so, for crafting, you can, you kind of have to put a down payment of half the price of the item. Yeah. And then you can... You have to succeed at your crafting check, and then you can either kind of pay the full price to kind of expedite things, you know, call in help, get in better supplies, or you can take your time and get kind of a discount and get it for up to half if you spend enough time working at it. So, can this also be a way to have your characters earn money during downtime? Yeah, so um, you can craft things for money, or you can do other jobs. So, like, uh, the bard might go <clears throat> perform at a tavern to make money uh, yeah. over the course of this. Um, or someone might work at a business or, you know, doing manual labor. Uh, there's all, all kinds of uh, stuff like that you can do during downtime. So, so further on from that, um, also does training kind of come into during downtime? Can you do little things that kind of help train your character in certain ways? Yeah, or... um, the main way that happens is with the retraining rules. So we introduced those in first edition as well. There's some stuff about that. Yeah. It's kind of like, or you can compare it to like respecking in an MMO, where you've got some abilities that aren't useful to you anymore or don't fit your character or their personality um, or you know your fighting style has evolved if you're a more martial character and so you can spend that time um, retraining your abilities and we kind of say like how long it takes and you might need to find a teacher or spend some money um, but you can swap out like most of the things you choose you can swap out during downtime um, a lot of that's like feats uh, spells um, things like that. There's stuff that's like, you know, you can't change your ancestry. You yeah. can't go from being a dwarf to an elf in, a down, in downtime in most situations, you know. Never say never when magic's uh, around. Um, but that's kind of like, the, the baseline is most of the things you've chosen for your character, yeah. you can uh, work on retraining. All right, so, um, but is there anything else in exploration, though, that we should touch on before we move on? Anything else that we should showcase? Uh, for exploration, uh, really, like I said, it, it's kind of the glue that holds everything together. So yeah. there's a lot of information on, like, we are in exploration. Uh, uh, we have these kind of exploration activities that kind of say, like, okay, we want the one of the thing, one of the issues that can happen a lot with uh, with exploring in RPGs is kind of everybody's trying to do everything at the same time, and we really want to kind of say, like, there's you can do one thing well. Yeah. You can try to do everything poorly, but like you're trying to do one thing well. Yeah. So like if you're really like looking for traps or you're really like trying to figure out the history of this ruin that you're in, that's kind of what you focus on as you're as you're moving yeah. about um, through through your location. Yeah. Um, so we have these activities that kind of say, here's the benefit you get for focusing on this thing as you're exploring.
Um, and then if you if an encounter would happen, like you uh, run across a, a really dangerous trap or against some other creatures, then you kind of transition to an encounter. And we talk a, a bit about you know how you manage that for the GM, how you manage that tradition uh, transition from exploring to being an encounter. Yeah, and I think this here is uh, also the page that we kind of have with the rule book. For yeah, that's, and that's stuff like that. showing some exploration there. And um, so obviously after exploration, and also this also for people, so you can get a glimpse of it and obviously we plan on. So for after all the exploration, after you've looked for the traps and everything else, um, what would happen for certain encounters? Uh, I don't know if you want to go into more of the action economy that we have. Sure, like the yeah. Turn action economy. Um, and um, so how does that begin? Like how... It, like I'm, a, I'm a big ignorant of it all. So how does that all work out? Um, so, just like in in first edition, you're gonna roll initiative. However, initiative works a little differently now. Yeah. Uh, in first edition, you had a stat based in your decks for your initiative, and now we kind of wanted a little more flexibility in how fights can start. And, yeah. And encourage different setups. So now you can roll different types of checks. The default is it's going to be a perception check because it's like I have perceived danger. Uh, see, see who is uh, you know kind of encounter each other first by yeah. by seeing who has the higher perception. But say I'm sneaking up on somebody, I'm going to roll stealth for my initiative because I'm kind of doing a task that puts me in a different spot. Uh, another example I like to give is, you know, if you're talking to uh, you know an evil uh, noble yeah. and you want to surprise attack them, you might roll a deception check to try to keep your intentions hidden, and yeah. you might roll deception for initiative. Um, so there's a lot of kind of flexibility with that. Uh, and then once you've rolled initiative, now you start doing six second rounds. Um, and that's when we get into the kind of uh, the action economy of the encounters. Yeah. So do you want to give a, an example of one on how my one might kind of mm -hmm. work out in just a quick little way? Yeah. So let me um, give me a second here, Chang, so we have to do a little setup for this one. So yeah. let's see if it works. And there we go. All right. So basically, say, for example, like just to kind of demonstrate real quick, if you'd like, mm -hmm. um, we have our little little setup here. So how exactly would, um, yes, we understand that. So basically, show me how movement would work under attacking, just in general terms. We don't have sure. character sheets and stuff like that right now, but in general, show me how. Say for example, we want to take our champion here and move it up to the goblin. Um, what's what kind of actions can I take? So the important thing, and this is um, the action economy, if you played the playtest, is pretty similar. So you're going to have three actions on each turn. Those are represented by a little diamond symbol, kind of like that. And then you're going to have one action each round that you might be able to take off your turn instead of just on your turn. And that's represented by an arrow symbol, kind of like this. So uh, Sela, the champion, starts her turn. She gets her three actions. Uh, and she decides she wants to try to defend um, the rogue against this goblin. So the first thing she's going to do is she's going to step here and... Oh, there we go. <laughs> it's a whole weird process of it. So we can move her here. Yep. Uh, and then... Uh... <laughs> we get it, Photoshop. I understand you. Photoshop is just trying to help. Um... And so that's, you know, her first action. Uh, she is going to uh, take an attack at the goblin. So her second action, she's going to make a strike. That's action two. Uh, and then for her third action, uh, her strike is, is decent, but the goblin's still up. Yeah. Um, and she decides, look, I'm, I'm, here, uh, I'm here to survive. So she's going to spend her third action to raise her shield. Um, so that's how she might play out her turn. But there are a lot of other options. Um, one of the big things with our action economy is those three actions you can use for whatever you want. If you're familiar with Pathfinder First Edition, you would have a standard action which you can use for certain things, a move yeah. action which you can use for certain things. You can combine them all into a full round action to use for certain things. Now we just say everything is going to be in, in some chunk of three actions yeah. if it's something that you can do within your own turn, or it's going to be a reaction uh, if you can use it off your turn. Uh, so Sela might have... Uh, she could have just attacked two times, you know, uh, instead of uh, raising her shield. She could have just smacked that goblin again, and maybe he drops. Um, you, take a, you take a penalty yeah. on your extra attack, so she would have taken a, a minus five because it was her second attack. Uh, but still, you know, if she thinks that's going to take down the goblin, that might be her best play. Um, she could have, uh, you know, changed... Her whole course there, she could have, uh, if she decided 
Um, you know what? The, the rogue is going to be okay. I am not going to... Uh, I'm not going to move over here. Instead, I'm going to go over behind the goblin. Uh, and uh, I am going to make it so that the rogue can flank. So she spends her first action to move, and then she attacks the goblin and raises her shield. Yeah. So there's a lot of different ways you can build your turn. Um, we want to kind of add that more flexibility in there. Yeah, and say, for example, for the wizard and stuff, just so help, just make sure I understand it. Mm -hmm. So basically, say for the wizard has his three actions, now it's his turn. He yeah. can, can he do three spells, or can he move, move, then a spell? Uh, it all depends on the spells. Yeah, because each so, spell has a certain amount of actions that's that it right. takes. Correct. So the, the standard for a spell um, is two actions. So uh, most spells like fireball, stuff like that, they're going to be two actions. So he can like move and cast a spell. <clears throat> so uh, that's kind of the baseline. If you're just encountering a spell, you can usually assume it's two actions. But some are different. So for example, the shield spell is a cantrip that you yeah. can cast for one action. So Ezrin might cast a two-action spell at that goblin and then uh, make a shield of magic with his remaining action. Yeah. So, Chen has a couple interesting questions here. Um, to kind of summarize a couple of them, uh, how many actions in a surprise round and how do surprise rounds work? Uh, we don't really have surprise rounds. Okay. Um, so, getting higher initiative is going to be your, your benefit of surprise. Yeah. So, um, I know a lot of that is like that using stealth for initiative and stuff like that, that's, that's how you get your surprise, right? You yeah. snuck up on them and therefore you get to go before them. Because you have three actions per turn, really going early in initiative, you have a lot, a pretty yeah. pretty sizable advantage because you can move up to somebody and attack them twice and, yeah. and stuff like that. Um, also, uh, classes that are really good at surprise, like the rogue, they get special advantages on that first round. Yeah. They have a surprise attack class feature that makes them better when, they, uh, yeah. when they're going before somebody. And, um, of course, the other question, do you take a penalty if it's a different type of attack? Uh, for the multiple attacks? Yeah, like um, uh, one melee, one spell. Uh, so we have a system of traits. So mm -hmm. anything that is going to counter that penalty is going to have the attack trait. Yeah. So like usually spells don't unless it's a very attack focused spell. So usually if you're doing like a, a multi-class fighter wizard type character, yeah. you can cast a two action spell and still make a swing and that swing is at your full bonus. Yeah. But because you're multi-classed, it might be a little less accurate than an actual fighters, for example. Um, also, there are some things that are not stabbing someone with your weapon that are still attacks. So, like yeah. trying to grapple somebody is an attack. So, there are some things like that that are that are uh, going to count toward that penalty. But it's all kind of clearly labeled using the trait system. And um, so, one of the things we're going to do, we're going to take a tiny break. So, Aaron, uh, Aaron's over here behind the cameras and something to kind of help us out with the uh, giveaway system. So, Aaron, if you want to go ahead and start one of the uh, giveaway kind of countdowns and stuff like that for one of the Fumbus coins. Uh, these are the limited edition ones. You can't buy these. Uh, they all have Fumbus on them. Unfortunately, I can't zoom in on them. But if you've seen some of the social media posts, you'll see a little preview of these. So pretty much an exclamation point giveaway. Make sure that you are in the United States, United States and Europe and stuff like that. Uh, that's the only place we've been kind of shipped to right now. And uh, make sure you have whispers enabled on Twitch. So if you do win, I can actually whisper you and get your email so we can then, at a better location, get your information and all that stuff to send you your coin. So... A lot of that's going on. So now we got through majority of encounters and stuff like that. Uh, is there anything else about encounters that you think we should touch on or kind of go with? Um, so to, to add one more little bit to what I was saying with kind of your spell casting. Yeah. Um, there are also spells that have a variable number of actions. So like if Ezrin had magic missile, he can just spend one action to shoot a missile or two for two missiles yeah. or three for three missiles. So having the three action thing gives us a lot of flexibility and also like... If you're running a game, it also makes it really easy to figure out how to improvise things. Yeah. Because you can kind of say, like, that seems like it should take an action. That seems yeah. like it should take two actions. Uh, it goes really quickly. That's the only thing I really wanted to add there. And that's correct. We can do Europe. Okay, so next up, along with that, uh, we've already gone through initiatives. Um, on Pretty much all initiatives going through. Uh, how does turn order work out is it uh, so so for the initiative um like let's say in that situation you know we were, we were showing the the champion moving yeah uh, so say she won initiative and, and goes first uh then you're just gonna go in order from highest to lowest initiative yeah and once everybody's gone you're gonna cycle back to the the top of the order um 
there are you can delay if you want to change your initiative position. You just move out and yeah. move back in later. Um, there's also readying an action. Uh, ready in action does not change your initiative because you're choosing to do one thing. So you spend two actions in advance and decide what your condition is going to be, and then you can take uh, you can do something that normally costs one action as a reaction. Uh, so that lets you like I'm going to hit the goblin if you if it tries to yeah. pass me and that kind of stuff. And Aaron, uh, go ahead and stop the giveaway and stuff like that, so we can and start up a whole nother one uh, as soon as we the thing and go ahead and pick your winner. And let's see who win. And Pix Otter, congratulations, man. Congratulations on your famous coin. I'm gonna put that to the side. You wanna you wanna hold on to that coin for him? Yeah. Safekeeping. So we'll just hide it somewhere. I mean and we'll be sending it, it to you. And of course we're gonna start up a whole nother uh giveaway and stuff like that. So Aaron, once you're done and ready, you can go ahead and start up another one. Alright, so further on for that, um, now we're going through that, that. Now for basically melee combat. One thing I want to touch on melee combat that a lot of people sometimes feel that here's this cool wizard and he's doing all this cool stuff. What about melee combat? What's, what's some yeah. of the special things about melee combat that we have? All right. Uh, so one of the things um, about the, the new action economy is that it opens up melee combat a mm -hmm. lot. Um, we also made it so attacks of opportunity are not something that everybody has. Um, because one of the issues with Pathfinder 1 is that fights could get really static because yeah. of how the actions work, how attacks of opportunity work. So usually it's the best thing to get next to somebody and stay there and just attack a whole bunch. Yeah. Um, with a few exceptions, but usually if you're a melee combatant, that's, that's your best bet. Now you're going to have a lot more flexibility because you're going to have more freedom to move around most of the time, uh, and you're going to be able to spin those those actions on your turn in different styles of attacks. Yeah. So if you're a fighter, you might get uh, an attack that spent, costs two of your actions but gets a really a cool extra effect yeah. that you really want on there. Um, and some of those you're going to want ones that you can use all the time and others that you want for specialty situations, like maybe I want something that's going to be good at knocking someone back, so I take that instead. So that if you know I'm fighting someone on a cliff, I have an option to knock them over. Um, and also, there's just uh, like with all those actions, there's a whole bunch more options. And also, just uh, like the pure damage you can put out yeah. as a as a martial character is much stronger. And part of that is kind of how we rebalance some things on the spellcaster side. Yeah. Um, but like, if you really just like you want to destroy one enemy, the the martial characters are going to be really great at that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, one thing that we haven't talked on way too much is flanking and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I know we touched on it for a little bit, but how does yeah. flanking work in Pathfinder 2nd Edition? Uh, so flanking works as long as you are on opposite sides of an enemy, if you want to go back to the to Photoshop there. So uh, say the, the champion is there. Um, if the rogue uh, just moves over next to that goblin. Here, I'll get you here. So say, for example, roll comes up. That's not going to be a flank. Because the important thing about flanking is that you have to be on opposite sides. So the so. rogue would need to be one uh, step over, and now she's flanking. So mm -hmm. basically you, you look and kind of draw a line between, uh, between the two of you and see if it passes uh, through the enemy uh, cleanly. So you can cross diagonally, or you can cross horizontally. And then on larger creatures, you have a little bit more flexibility because... Uh, you can kind of do yeah. um, either either point on each side of them to, to get your flank. Um, <clears throat> and now flanking uh, gives them the flat-footed condition against yeah. anybody who's flanking them. Uh, flat-footed um, in second edition is just a minus two to AC. So it's a condition we kind of use uh, a lot of the time in order to uh, kind of simplify how someone being exposed to attacks works. Yeah. So most things that are going to make you easier to hit are going to make you flat-footed. Yeah. Um, which is going to give the rogue a lot more opportunities to, uh, to get their sneak attacks in. And, uh, a lot more different ways to kind of get that, that, uh, yeah. that uh, accuracy boost for the attacker. All right. So uh, do the time and everything else. We'll kind of go ahead and go forward just a little bit more here. Okay. That... Um, so one of the things that people have been super curious about is magic. So how does magic work in Pathfinder 2nd Edition? Like, are there different kinds of magic? Like, are there yeah. separate things for it? Or uh, Yeah, so one of the things we did was kind of expand the arcane traditions. Um, 
So in Pathfinder 1, there's kind of there's arcane magic and there's divine magic, uh, but that didn't quite fit the world uh, exactly perfectly. It was kind of a, mm-hmm. a, a hand-me-down from third edition, and there was kind of some there's more to it in the Pathfinder world that we wanted to get more in depth into. So now there are four traditions. There is arcane, divine, occult, and primal. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the core rulebook, you have uh, the wizard who is arcane. You have the uh, Cleric, who is divine. Yes. You have the druid, who is primal. You have the bard, who is a cult. And then you have the sorcerer, who can be any of those, depending on their magical bloodline. Yeah. So um, you can be like a celestial sorcerer or a primal right. sorcerer. Yeah, and the so celestial sorcerer would cast divine spells. The primal yeah. sorcerer would cast... Uh, mm-hmm. uh, or the, the face sorcerer would cast primal spells. Um, so one of the things uh, that happens with that is that we have, have four spell lists that are... Uh, dedicated to each of those traditions. Yeah. Um, rather than having here's the sorcerer list, here's the wizard list, here's the cleric list, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, they're kind of boiled down to those traditions, so they're a little easier to do, yeah. and it lets us do stuff like the sorcerer who can use different spell lists. Um, now, a lot of classes have some way to get additional spells that fit their theme mm-hmm. added to that list. So the cleric, for example, depending on what uh, deity they follow, they might get spells that are not on the divine list but are thematically appropriate to that deity. And, um, and Aaron, uh, did we get a second winner for the, uh, yeah, let's go and pick the second winner for the other Fumbus coin. And Deathly Hallwell, congratulations, buddy. You've now got yourself a Fumbus coin, so we're going to put that in for safekeeping, if you don't All right. mind holding on to that. And Aaron, if you go and start up another giveaway, so we're going to go ahead and give away one of the lanyards here and stuff like that. So. All right. So further on from that, um, so Aaron's going to have for the traditions of magic and stuff like that. So, um, what about... A tradition spell list. Like, what is there anything specific for? Uh, they're all pretty much specific for each category. Each, right? each category, yeah. Yeah. Um, so each each list is good at different things. Um, arcane is kind of the longest list and kind of uh, kind of reaches yeah. toward the most territory. Um, which, if you played Path, Pathfinder First Edition, you're kind of used to like the the wizard list kind of being the big one. Yeah. Um, and arcane is kind of the one that like they're the students of magic. They s- study the most things, and so they're this is kind of the most expansive. Um, but there's a concept called kind of the essences of, yeah. of magic, and each each of the lists kind of uh, looks at one of those. So, like, there's a mind essence, and that's something that occult magic and arcane magic both affect the mind. Yeah. Whereas uh, the matter essence, which is more physical things, arcane magic and primal magic uh, focus primarily on that. So, like, arcane is kind of the, the crossover between those two. It's in the middle of the Venn yeah. diagram. So, in... Along that, like, how does magic you or how how does magic work in combat? Like, okay. do you use your intelligence or do you use any other modifiers yeah. or ability scores to help with it? Or? Yeah, you do. So it's going to depend on your class. So the wizard is uses their intelligence. The uh, druid uses their wisdom. The bard uses their charisma. That's kind of how uh, that's how you understand and interface with your magical power. Um, if a spell has a saving throw, you're going to set a DC that's based on that ability. Um, modifier if it has an attack roll like it's something that you have to aim at somebody you have to uh, uh, shoot that ray of frost directly at chat gonna get you Mm -hmm. Um, then you'd make a you'd use intelligence for your attack roll Um, it's called a a spell attack roll so um, you don't have to have like uh, in first edition you had to have a really good dex but it went against touch AC, so it was really accurate anyway, which is kind of a, a back and forth. We kind of simplified that down to just you're using your uh, your um, spell casting ability modifier instead because that's something a lot of people were looking for and uh, made a lot of sense for how we wanted to set up the game. And also just to help out, chat, we're, we're going to have some, we're able to sit down and answer your questions at the end of the stream. And also for those of you who win, we'll be contacting you after the stream uh, to basically you know, get, get you settled in. Uh, but one question that we had here, um, I wonder if we can talk about this one. Um, will a spell description entry tell you which list it appears on? Uh, yes, it will. There, there are a couple things that people really asked for from the playtest, and one was having the tradition listed in the spell, um, which we have added, and the other was having like an entry on whether it allows yeah. a saving throw. So we do have those uh, those in the stat blocks. Okay. There. And uh, so further on for magic. Um, We've already got it for using combat for combat and stuff like that. Uh, spell levels. Um, mm-hmm. What about spell levels? 
Um, so, uh, so spells come in ten levels. Yeah. Uh, if you played first edition, they went in nine levels. Now there's there's a tenth level that yeah. you, you get. Uh, you get one tenth level spell slot. Nineteenth level, uh, because those spells are super powerful, you have to spend a feat if you want to get a second tenth level spell slot, and yeah. that's your twentieth level feat. And it actually has some serious competition where you might not want a tenth level spell because some of the other feats are just really um, that powerful. Yeah. Uh, now, the spell levels um, in first edition, you had a caster level that would determine some of the things they did, which meant that your first level spells got better and better and better, yeah. and you were getting more spell slots, and like you were getting new spells, so you just got so much better at higher levels, um, even with your lower level spells. Uh, for second edition, we really wanted to say, like, okay, the spell level matters. Uh, the, so instead we have a heightening system where the spell slot you put it in is going to determine the power of the spell. So if I want my magic missiles to get stronger, I need to prepare them in a third level slot instead of a first level slot. And that's just kind of the, the basis of how, how spell power is determined. Um, which means that you might want to change out what your low level spells are to kind of take advantage of the ones that are going to uh, you know, not necessarily do damage or not necessarily try to incapacitate somebody, yeah. but you're going to want those to be more utility spells, more buff spells. So there's still going to be a purpose to those, but they aren't just here's a very strong spell yeah. that doesn't use as important of a resource as yeah. some of the other ones. And uh, did you did you bring me any slides or stuff to kind of show off some of the magic? Uh, I think I might have. Okay. Uh, know, what do we have? We'll see if they decide to work today. <laughs> and maybe there we go. Chapter four That's for spells. skills or skills. Nope. There's there a spell. Go. There we go. Yeah, some just a nice visual it. aid there. Um, and uh, you can see what, what else is on that page. Um, that spell, I believe you'll find under, under the letter F. Um, <clears throat> the F for fire. Uh, and you can see underneath it there, you've got flesh to stone, floating disc, fly, and forbidding ward. Uh, forbidding ward is a new spell in this edition. Yeah. Um, we also did a little bit of uh, rebouncing of some of the spells uh, to kind of reflect how... Uh, how complex we wanted gameplay. So, example, for example, the fly spell, which was third edition or third level before, is now fourth level, mm -hmm. and a lot of that is because once you introduce fly, encounters get trickier to kind of deal with and play with at the table. Um, we didn't want to kind of have every monster need to de be able to deal with flying PCs quite so early in the game, um, and so uh, and we also changed uh, fly a little bit after the playtest, where now your fly speed is equal to your land speed. So like if you're a monk and you're super fast, you're super fast in the air as well, yeah. instead of just on the ground. Um, uh, before you continue on, um, Captain Jack had an interesting question. If a wizard wants to cast like magic missile mm -hmm. on a third level, as, as a third level spell, yeah. does it need to be in their spell book as a third level spell, or well, having, its first level, having it as a first level spell suffice? So I think we can also talk about that along with heightening spells. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah. So if a Sorry wizard has, if a, if a wizard has magic missile in their spell book, um, the wizard gets to prepare spells so they can put it in a higher slot. Yeah. Um, it works a little differently for like a sorcerer because they kind of just uh, inherently know their spells. Yeah. Um, but a wizard can prepare it in any of their slots. That's kind of one of the advantages of being a prepared spellcaster. Yeah. Uh, among some, among others. Um, <clears throat> So the way heightening works, uh, and the wizard is kind of the easiest way to explain it because the wizard can do this. Say that uh, Ezrin has Ezrin the wizard has magic missile. Uh, it is a minimum first level spell, so he can prepare that in a first level slot, uh, and he'll get some pretty decent yeah. uh, magic missiles. But he's going up in level. His enemies are getting tougher. That one d four plus one damage per missile isn't quite doing it anymore. Yeah. So he decides to prepare it in his third level spell slot. Uh, magic missile, uh, if you heighten it, you shoot an additional missile with each action you spin. So now instead of doing 1d4 plus 1 per action, he's doing 2d4 plus 2 per action. So it's getting more efficient. Yeah. Uh, so, and that'll, that'll keep happening as it goes up in level. Usually what happens with these is, for example, fireball. Preparing a... Seventh level fireball instead of a third level fireball, that's going to be way better than your third level fireball. But a native seventh level spell usually is going to be able to do just something a little bit more. So if you really want to do that fire damage, that fireball is a great choice. But some of the other damaging spells at that level, like a seventh level spell, is just typically going to be yeah. have a little more juice to it. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a few questions here from chat real quick. And uh, Aaron, I think we already had a winner for that lanyard, correct? 
yeah, uh, if we didn't pick a uh, winner for the lanyard and stuff, go ahead and pick one. And um, and after that, you can go ahead and start another giveaway in chat for the poster. So go ahead and get all this stuff off my desk so they can all <laughs> enjoy it. We have, and I have an entire box of posters, so we have tons of things nice. to give away further on. Can I have one? Yeah, sure. Right, cool. As we kind of take a short break here from yapping so much. There you go. So further on from that, um, so we're going to talk for magic. And also, you can read some of the descriptions and sure. stuff inside yeah. the book. That'll, that'll be okay. And um, let's go for hiding stuff. What about cantrips? And stuff like that. Uh, I know we have cantrips in Pathfinder Second. Edition. Yeah, we do. Uh, so cantrips are the spells you can use any number of times. Other spells are going to take spell slots. So if I cast a fireball, I have expended that spell slot and I can't cast it again. Yeah. Your cantrips are spells that are cast any number of times. They're not as strong, but they are automatically the highest level you can cast. So if I take uh, the telekinetic projectile spell or the electric arc spell, those are attack spells that I can just use over and over again. And usually they're going to be better for me than than like shooting my crossbow because yeah. they're going to use my intelligence, which is better than my dexterity, and uh, they're going to have some kind of magic-y effect. Yeah. <clears throat> and a lot of those are really good. Like Ray of Frost, for example, if you, an enemy is weak to cold, having that Ray of Frost that you can just keep using over and over, that's really useful. Um, and there's also a bunch of utility things in there like the light spell, like detect magic. Um, and most casters are going to get five cantrips. Yeah. There are also a lot of ways like uh, different ancestries might give you cantrips. Uh, so, you know, if you're a gnome, you can have some kind of like your fey magic that, yeah. that is uh, just a part of you. So you get some cantrips from, from taking an ancestry feat. Cool. And um, from cantrips and stuff like that, um, I think we just gave like a telekinetic retail example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and so, for, so for that, uh, how many actions does a spell cost? I know some spells probably just cast one action to do, but some spells might be just so powerful to cost multiple. So. Yeah, so they can really run the gamut from um, there are a few spells that are <clears throat> even reactions. So uh, like Feather Fall, that is something that's like, oh, someone's falling, I'm going to cast that immediately. There are ones that cast one action, um, and a big category of this that I think we'll talk about in a, in a second here are focus spells. Yes. A lot of them cost only one action. Uh, like I said earlier, two is kind of the, the standard for most like combat spells. Um, so something like like Levitate that I'm looking at here or uh, Electric Arc, those are two action spells. Um, and then some of the more complicated ones are three action spells. And those will be things that like they take a fair amount of work to kind of uh, uh, work out at the table. Stuff like Wall of Fire. Um, I'm making a whole wall in the battlefield. That's going to take three actions. Uh, another good example of things that cost three actions would be well time stop costs three actions but yeah. it gives you nine actions so it's a net gain uh, you want to read what time stop does sure uh time stop um you spend three actions uh it's on the arcane and occult list it's one of those 10th level spells because yeah. you are stopping time maybe that should be high level just just a thought um you spent your three actions, but you immediately get nine actions that you can take in three sets uh, of three actions each. So yeah. basically like getting three turns. Um, and uh, time passes for you. So like if you have something that's going to take that is supposed to last three rounds, you can burn through that all in your time yeah. stop. Um, you know, if somebody casts a spell on you that's going to last three rounds and you don't want it there, it's just like, I'm going to time stop. Get rid of that. Um, and anything you do during that duration doesn't affect other people, so you can't just like you know uh, cone of cold them or whatever mm -hmm. it is. But anything you create there, so like I I spend three of those actions to make a wall of fire, that's still there when you end the time stop. So for everybody else who's yeah. going in normal time, they're just like, what happened? Yeah, There's like, a wall of fire around me. I don't know where that came from. That wizard went like this. Yeah. And now I'm dying. Um, <clears throat> so that's that's how time stop works. So you can. Yeah, you can let your mind run with the the possibilities. And for if how uh, spells work, we'll kind of go out of order here that we got mm -hmm. here. Uh, how do rituals work? I know someone in chat rituals, was asking yeah. about rituals, so we're trying to okay. answer your question. So how do uh, they work? So rituals are something where you don't even have to be a spellcaster to conduct a ritual. Yeah, they are a spell, but they're kind of skill based and they take significant amounts of time. So uh, rituals are things like uh, resurrecting the dead. So uh, resurrect is one of the rituals. Um, atoning for uh, your sins, mm -hmm. uh, animating objects or creating undead, those are all rituals, consecrating places. Um, uh, so these are all things that um, are really important story um, processes, like, uh, but aren't really something that you can just 
preparing a spell slot and cast, and then that's yeah. it. So, uh, for example, if I'm going to, <clears throat> let's say that due to unfortunate circumstances, your character has died. Yeah. So like, well, Why'd you do it? <laughs> we thought about it, and we guess we were willing to part with some money and bring Peyton's character back. Yeah. Uh, so it takes one day to cast the Resurrect Ritual. <clears throat> um, it costs you diamonds that are worth 75 GP times the target's level. Yeah. <clears throat> And it's a, <clears throat> excuse me, a fifth level ritual. Okay. And uh, a lot of rituals let you bring in secondary casters who can kind of help out. Mm -hmm. um, so the primary check is a religion check, and you have to be an expert to do it. Uh, you have to be an expert in religion. Uh, and then it allows, uh, the secondary casters can make medicine and society checks to help yeah. And you try to bring the dead uh, creature back. Uh, because it's resurrection, and that's a complicated topic, this is a, a, a very long spell, yeah. so I'm not going to read the whole thing. But, How long uh, is it in the book? It is like... uh, about half a page. Oh. Yeah. But there's, oh. a, there's a lot going on there, and there's a lot more. A lot of that is kind of the heightened effects. So if you cast as a 7th level spell, you don't, need their, you don't need any portion of their body. You can bring them out without a body. You want to show them as a reference of just... And sure. resurrect yeah. is... This call. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know the light's not allowing you to see too much of it, but... And that's one cool. of the things, like, some of the rituals are longer because they are things that are taking a big space in the story, taking a lot of, uh, a fair amount of time at the table because they're big, important plot yeah. moments, whereas most individual spells are not this long. Yeah. Um, or at least if they are, they're like, it's because it's got a whole bunch of different animal forms and you're really yeah. looking at one. There's a lot of criteria for the resurrection yeah. stuff, so it needs um, to specify. So, for example, if your, if your ritual succeeds, um, you bring them back to life with one hit point, uh, and you know none of their spells, uh, any long-term things still affect them, that kind of stuff. And they've got uh, some pretty nasty conditions that last for a week. Uh, if you critically succeed, they've got their full hit points, every spell they had when they left, um, and you know they uh, uh, they meet an agent of their deity during the resurrection who inspires them, and they get some bonuses. So like a critical su success, like they come back better. Yeah. Um, if you fail, they're still dead. And if you critically fail, I'll, I'll just read this one. Uh, something goes horribly wrong. An evil spirit possesses the body. The body transforms into a special kind of undead or some worse fate befalls the target. So uh, that's one of the things with kind of our success and failure system uh, and the critical successes yeah. and critical failures is there's a lot more opportunities uh, for introducing kind of interesting risks to the game. Yeah. Because we don't want, especially something like Resurrection, you don't want that to be just like, it's and, just automatic. Yeah. Like, and it happens. Yeah, that's not that interesting for your story. Um, so we wanted to introduce some things that kind of make make those feel more like they're part of the world, like there's a story that can go different directions yeah. rather than kind of being perfunctory. So one last thing that we can kind of touch on as of that, unless there was anything about magic that is super important, uh, along with like uh, focus. I spells did want to talk about focus spells. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so focus spells are kind of in between the cantrip and the spell slot. Yeah, they're more powerful than a cantrip, um, and they're heightened uh, to your highest level the same way a cantrip is. Yeah, um, but they aren't as powerful as a spell slot. The main uh, point of focus spells is that there's something that's very thematic to your character. So, for example. If I'm a specialist wizard and I specialize in enchantment, I get a focus spell that is very enchantment themed. Now, the thing about your theme is that we want you to be able to fulfill that theme often. So uh, to cast your focus spells, you have to expend a resource called a focus point. You typically start with one, but if you get more into your focus, you can get two, two or three total. You can cast the spell for your focus point and then you can refocus, which is a way of getting back a focus point. Uh, and you have to spend 10 minutes doing something that is really thematically tied to uh, whatever the source of your focus spells is. Yeah. So for example, a monk might, uh, who can get use feats to get focus spells, might need to meditate to get those focus spells back. A wizard might need to study to get their focus spells back. A cleric is going to have to do something in service to their deity. And yeah. you know, sometimes that's like, if your deity is a healing deity, maybe you're healing somebody. And, and that means you're getting something else accomplished, but that's also a service to your deity. And you yeah. can kind of do the two simultaneously. Um, if you're a sorcerer, magic comes from your blood. So you just have to be alive. Yeah, just be alive for 10 minutes. And you got um, it. 
So that gives us kind of a way to say, here's something that's really cool and thematic about you, and it can keep coming up. That's also one of the reasons a lot of the focus spells cost one action or something like that, is because there's something we want you to be able to cast your big spell from your spell slot, but also do your focus spell, and kind of it enables the rest of how your character yeah. works and how they behave in the world. So, unfortunately, we're starting to run out of time here a little bit, but I want to touch on real quick about skills before okay. we go into just asking, asking you a bunch of questions. Yeah. So you want to touch on skills a little bit and before we switch over to sure. Q&A questions? Um, so skills. Uh, I'll see. I think we have a nice slide for it, actually. Yes, we do. There we go. All right. So uh, skills are, um, there's a smaller number of them from uh, first edition. Uh, we aren't having you spin skill points as uh, in kind of small chunks as much. Instead, uh, what you do is you get proficiencies. And I think you probably talked about the proficiency system on the previous episode. Yeah. You kind of train gives you two plus your level, expert four plus your level, and so on. Um, so when you're picking your skill increases, you get those every two levels. Uh, when you're picking those, you're kind of focusing on one thing at a time. So you still have a lot of the granularity of skill uh, ranks from first edition, but without quite as much bookkeeping. Um, there's still going to be like, uh, it, it's going to be more of a, an individual choice where you say, like, okay, I want to get really good at Intimidation now. I'm going to spend this. Rather than, like, well, I keep getting good at Intimidation every level and kind of keep making the same choice over and over again mm -hmm. for, a lot of, for a lot of players. Um, and then if you really want to diversify your skills, there are skill feats you can take if, yeah. you, if you still want to do that. Um, so that's kind of, like, the basics of how skills work. Uh, the, um, we want to talk about some specific skills. Yeah, give, give me one specific skill that we can uh, okay. switch on over to uh, name. Well, one of the ones, a lot of them you're kind of familiar with. Uh, they might have some, some different uses. They might use a different stat. But uh, one of the ones that we put kind of like a lot of work into making a more core part of the game is crafting. Yeah. Um, to kind of, because like thematically that's a thing that, you know, a lot of characters is like, I was a blacksmith or, or yeah. whatever it is. Um, so we wanted to make sure that crafting had more of a role in the game. So one of the big things it can do is... Uh, so you can repair things with crafting, which is going to come up more often because of kind of how our shields work, for example. So if the fighter is getting in there and his shield gets broken, uh, or the champion's shield gets broken and she wants to, to have her shield back, someone who's trained in crafting can repair that over the yeah. course of like, a, like 10 minutes or so. They can attempt a crafting check and repair it. Um, so that's something where that's kind of happening in the rest of the game. And then we already kind of talked about how you can yeah. use it in downtime. And, um, so you can, so for example, crafting has five actions tied to it. One is uh, repair, one is craft. You can also recall knowledge. So yeah. anybody can try a ch crafting check to just be like, is this a nice, is this table well constructed? Um, uh, you can also try to earn income, which is one of the downtime things we were talking about. So like, I'm just going to, I'm going to be doing pottery and, yeah. and making money selling my pots. Uh, and you can also identify alchemy because crafting is a skill kind of tied to alchemy. So if you're trained in crafting, you can try to identify alchemical items. So, other than that, let's go ahead and start bringing up questions from chat. Okay. So they can go and ask you. So chat, uh, the best way to kind of ask a question, by the way, is to do at uh, Paizo official, so I can basically see you kind of show up as red, and then on my little screen here, I can actually see your question a little bit better, and then you can ask Hogan here almost anything. Yeah. Almost anything. It's like a Reddit AMA. Right. Except why. A ask me almost anything, AMAA. Yeah, AMA, 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 AMA. So, but I can go and grab Pre one. Preferably the... about Pathfinder. Yeah, too. preferably. Uh, but one question we'll grab here from uh, Santo here. Uh, what, uh, what about knowledge to identify a monster? Do we have mm -hmm. anything similar to that? Yeah, we do. So um, how you identify a monster is going to depend on some of the monster's traits. Uh, and we have kind of a list of those. It's in the uh, uh, GMing section. Uh, because the GM might decide that, like, due to the certain circumstances about the monster, you use a different skill for it. Yeah. Um, there's also lore skills, uh, which are very specific. So it's like, if I take the vampire lore skill, I can use that to to try to identify vampires, and I'm probably going to have a lower DC for that. Yeah. Um, so, for example, some of the some of the traits that are in here. Uh, identifying an aberration is usually the occultism skill. Identifying an animal is usually nature. Identifying a uh, construct, you can use arcana or crafting. So, yeah. hey, going back to that crafting thing, uh, because they're a constructed creature, you can use crafting to identify them. Um, undead use religion. 
uh, elementals use arcana or nature. So there's there's a, a little table, um, in the, uh, the jamming section that kind of goes through all that. Okay. Uh, one question that I saw just kind of got scrolled up here. Let's see. Um, someone asked, can they heighten a ritual? Yep, absolutely. Um, so some of the like I was saying with uh, resurrection, some of those stronger effects uh, you have to heighten to get it. So like if you Heighten it to 6th level, um, it increases the cap on the target's level because uh, the base one, the dead creature, can be um, up to 10th level, but to get a more powerful creature back, um, uh, you'll have to heighten it. So 6th level, uh, you resurrect a creature up to 12th level, and the cost is 125 GP instead of 75 GP per level. 7th level, you don't need the body, um, and the, the spell creates a new body. Um, and they have to have died within uh, the last decade, um, which uh, is an extension. Um, and it also has like a level increase and a cost increase. Yeah. So yeah, so a, a fair number of the rituals do have something like that. And a lot of them also just have like a more basic, uh, this costs more and can yeah. do a higher level creature, like um, creating dead, undead and, and stuff. And quickly, you want to grab a question here? Um, sure. I don't know if you can kind of see my little screen here. Uh, um, see which one you want to pick here. Hmm. Oh, whether the sorcerer can recover their focus? Wow. Yeah, the the sorcerer just gets it back. If they if the sorcerer spent ten minutes, it doesn't matter what else they're doing. Their magical blood is just yeah. replenishing their magical energy. So and just in case you guys could hear Aaron because of our oh yeah sort of microphones and stuff like that, they uh, he asked. Or you caught one of your questions of can the sorcerer regain their focus in another mean? Right. Yeah. Can they re regain it while they're doing other things? And yeah, they they totally can. And um, so let's go and grab a few more questions here. Um, if you see one that you like, you can go sure. and go through. So we're just kind of kind of scroll through here on our little thing here. Uh, let's see. Uh, multiclassing. Uh, not for you to answer, but Friday. Be here on Friday. We're going to talk more about multiclassing. So oh, that's uh, that's the day to talk about multiclassing. All right, here's one. Uh, what playtest feedback surprised you the most? Um, that's a pretty interesting one because there was a lot of stuff. Like, I think the most gen the the general answer to this is just like how much people, how happy people were yeah. with the playtest. There were a lot of things we ended up changing that people weren't happy with, but yeah. overall, like people were very positive. Um, which for a playtest, um, you, you know, you don't know, right? Yeah. Uh, but like. A lot of our, especially to changes, people were very positive, and there were a lot of things that's like, we don't know if people are going to like this at all, yeah. um, and they ended up liking it. Um, I think some of the uh, proposed changes to like like changing the paladin to the champion and allowing more alignments, uh, that was kind of surprising because yeah. um, you know it's like how traditional are people going to be versus wanting to see something new? Yeah, uh, and we found that overall, like people wanted to see a lot of new things. Um, so I think those are some of the, the more surprising ones. So let's grab. One more question here. Um, let's see here. What character class deviates the most from first edition? Uh, so, which character class deviates the most from first edition? There's, I, I would say there are kind of three main candidates. One is the champion, because of that kind of, you can be more than just a paladin, you can have different alignments. Um, so the, the core rulebook has three, the three good alignments, and you can be a redeemer, or a paladin, uh, or a uh, liberator. Um, and that kind of opens them up to more deities and to yeah. more kind of story potential. And kind of, uh, those are kind of roles that were already in the world and we're just kind of making them part of, uh, part of a single class. Um, they all follow a code, but the tenets change depending on your alignment. So that's a big change. Um, the next one is the sorcerer, because you can now be, you're not just limited to one list, you can have different different arcane traditions for the, the sorcerer. Uh, and then the third one is the alchemist, because we really wanted to make alchemy a core part of the game rather than kind of something that kind of got yeah. squished in and kind of had to play by the rules of spellcasting a little bit. We wanted to make alchemy a core part of the game. So the alchemist functions very differently. Um, and uh, on a more narrower level, they also got the alchemist also has a new iconic, so that's another change to the alchemist. Okay. So wanna, I think overall the alchemist probably is the the biggest change. You want to do a rapid round with me? Go sure. to a question. And say yes, no, real quick. Mm -hmm. All right. Will there be more champion types? Yes or no? Yes. Uh, how does sorcerer heightening 
work now? Kind of similar to what we just answered, I guess. Uh, so I think that question is probably getting at the... Uh, uh... You used to pick two spells that were kind of your ones you could yeah. heighten freely, and the other ones you had to learn at their level. Now you get one per spell level, so uh, that's the new way it works. Is um, you, you'll get more of them over time, yeah. uh, but you won't start out with that. Okay. As, as many. Uh, can you retrain your class? Uh, not normally. Um, I would say that's one like if the GM decides to allow it, it's not necessarily impossible in the way that like changing your ancestry is typically impossible. Um, but we don't really have that as a default option. Okay. Um, I don't know if I can answer that one. Can you speed up crafting time? Uh, you can take feats that will make it faster. That's usually, uh, skill feats are going to be the main way you do that. All right. So um, we're going to close off questions for a little bit because uh, one thing uh, that I want to do real quick. Um, so one of the things that I asked if I could do a certain thing and everything else is that we put a criteria of if we got so many viewers who would give away a core rulebook and stuff like that, but because of just how absolutely nice everyone has been, how welcoming all of you have been for me now coming in and kind of doing these shows with you all and everything else, and um, even though we still have a large amount of you, and I'm so grateful that all of you have started to come over, and, uh, and also, by the way, before we get to the thing, be sure if you also have any more questions about Pathfinder 2nd uh, Edition, uh, you can always go visit your Twitter, which will be in the little handle down below. And also Mark Seifter, who was here before, I think he has a Twitch channel, just to make sure I kind of get his information right here. Uh, it's twitch.tv twitch forward slash Mark Seifter. Um, and his show is called The Arcane Mark. You can always check out his Twitch channel if you ever want any more questions in between these streams. But because of how just absolutely positive everyone's been, and I appreciate all of you being here, I want to give away this book regardless. So we're going to pretty much take this book and we're going to give it away right now. So Aaron, if you want to go ahead and start a giveaway for this core rule book, just to say thank you all so much for just being here in general and stuff like that, because I'm super appreciative of everyone just being here, being super awesome and just showing up to these streams and stuff like that. And uh, I think I might get addicted to giving these away. So <laughs> Aaron, well it, is anybody trying to get it, Aaron? Has, has anybody? A okay. little bit. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, but uh, but I just want to say thank you all so much for showing up today. We greatly appreciate it. Please tell your friends to show up on Friday. We're going to talk about multi-classing, leveling up your character, stuff like that. Uh, with Steven, I believe. I believe. I believe so. And uh, further on from that, so thank you all so much for being here. Thank you so much, Bonner, for Absolutely. being here. And uh, while we still have a tiny bit more time, you want to grab a question or two that's sure. kind of in between? Yeah. Uh, let's see if we got one. Oh, God. I this... see someone asked giveaway. <laughs> Uh, so we don't know the, about that. No. They are uh, fifty nine ninety nine normally, <laughs> but for attending the stream, the low low price of free. Yes. So basically, on how this works, by the way, is that uh, for all the giveaways, for those you've already won and didn't quite understand what we said before and just got in a little bit late, uh, make sure whispers are enabled for Twitch so I can actually message you, and also make sure you're in like United States and Europe area so we can actually ship over to you because yeah, North America, yeah, that works too. And uh, Animal Companion work like in the play test. I don't know if we can we answer that. Um, I'm not the best person to answer that. Yeah, like um, they're, they're they're not vastly changed, but there were some kind of uh, numbers tweaks and a, a few kind of expansions and that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, has encounter difficulty XP rating changed at all? It always seems monsters two plus and all that. Uh, yeah. That. No, we we found the the. Encounter building uh, was working pretty well, so okay. the, the the basics of that are the same. Uh, one thing, one Logan thing to sign the book live in front of us. If I had a pen, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Toss it over. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. You can take my copy, I guess. Okay. The next comment is what I'm going to write in the inscription. Yeah. Like <laughs> sign whatever you want there. All right. Uh, so the. Um, the encounter building uh, rules didn't change, but one thing we got a lot of feedback on, and this is kind of a tangent, it just made me yeah. remember it, is uh, the skill assignment system. Mm -hmm. uh, people found too complicated, and even a lot of us were like, well, we're not quite sure how this works. Uh, so we have a much simpler skill DC setting system. Yeah. Now. It's basically uh, untrained DC is base 10, trained DC 15, expert 20, uh, master, I believe is 30, it's 25 or 30, I think it's... Uh, I think it's 30. Uh, and then Legendary is 40. Yeah. And then you can kind of adjust that uh, 
plus two, plus five, plus ten for like, uh, you know, easy, uh, very easy, incredibly easy, and on the flip side, yeah, uh, hard, uh, very hard, and incredibly hard. And it's been working really well. Um, and uh, you know, we've been implementing that for a while yeah. uh, internally. Um, so that's that's much easier to. Use. And there's still like one by level for yeah. stuff that should be level. Based. Okay, so are the books time. Can we go ahead and pick a winner, Aaron? See which one won. Yeah. Bardo Rock, Rock won again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you get a book now, man. He won a coin, I think, last time. So you're now excluded <laughs> forever. How, how's that spelled? Uh, you can get his name here. It is a B A R D A R O K. All right, it is, it is officially inscribed. Yeah, there you go. I don't know if you can 100% see that, but... Try not to tear the cover off holding it at a weird angle. Yeah, it's fine. But um, we'll get that shipped off to you, man. Um, everything else with that, I think we're done with our show today. Great. Thanks for so, having me. Thank you so much, man, for being here. Thank you so much, Aaron, for being in the back, managing on the giveaways, and thank everybody here for joining with us today. I uh, hope you all had an absolutely fantastic day today, and we hope you have enjoyed what we've shown all today. Remember to come back actually tomorrow for Oblivion Oath, because Oblivion Oath, I think, at 12 p.m. Central. No, not, I'm still on Central Time. Pacific. <laughs> and I'm not in Louisiana anymore. That um, basically join in for Oblivion Oath. You can see our schedule on our Twitch page and stuff like that once we go offline. Be sure to show up for that. We're playing Pathfinder 2nd Edition, so you can see how the game is played and see Jason Bowman, along with several of our cast, play the game. Along with on Friday, we'll be here with Steven, who his name is also on the cover. It is. And it's, he, it's a really long one. It's a super one. They like It's like an underline of everyone else's yeah. name. <laughs> that um, he will be here to talk about leveling up your character, multiclassing, all the good stuff. So with that, chat, I hope you have an absolutely lovely day. Thank you again, Aaron. Thank you again, Logan. I will see you guys next time.